Hi, in this video, I'm basically going to discuss the motion of a charged particle in the presence of an external electric field and a magnetic field. I'm going to talk in detail and I'm going to try to obtain the nature of the trajectory of the charged particle in different kinds of scenarios where the external electric field and magnetic field are present. So I have basically divided the whole video into four different cases where in the first case we have a situation where the particle is moving in a direction which is parallel to a electric field as well as the magnetic field. So where V is parallel to E is parallel to B. What is, what is the nature of the motion in this case? In case number two we basically have a situation where there is no electric field but only a magnetic field is present but the particle is moving in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. What kind of motion are we going to get then? In case number three we basically have the particle which is moving perpendicular to both the electric field as well as the magnetic field while the electric field and magnetic field are parallel to each other. What is the nature of the motion here? And then lastly, we basically have a particle which is at rest in the presence of a crossed electric and magnetic field. So if B and E are perpendicular to each other and there's a particle in that kind of a situation, what is the nature of the trajectory there? The nature of the motion in all four different cases are going to be different and I'm going to obtain what is the trajectory in all of these four different cases starting from first principles. If you want to jump to any one of these individual cases, I will provide the timestamp for those particular cases. Now let's begin. So in case number one, we have a situation where the particle is moving with the velocity v in the x-axis and it is moving in such a manner that it is parallel to an external electric field as well as a magnetic field which are also parallel to each other. Now before we invoke the equations of motion, first of all we need to know what is the nature of the force that is involved. So in situations like these when a charged particle is in the presence of an external electric as well as a magnetic field, the nature of the force law is basically given by the Lorentz force law. So the Lorentz force law basically states that whenever a charged particle is moving in the presence of an external electric and magnetic field, then the force experienced by that kind of a charged particle is given by Q E plus V cross B. Here the Q represents the charge of that particle. E represents the electric field, B represents the magnetic field and V represents the velocity. And all of these quantities are given in vector form. So here basically this force is consisting of both the electric force as well as the magnetic force. Now if you look at both these two forces, the first force is because of the electric field and the second force is because of the magnetic field, then the electric field will induce a force in a direction of the velocity. So the particle will start accelerating in this particular direction while the magnetic field has a cross product here. The cross product is between velocity and the magnetic field. So if you look at the cross product of velocity and the magnetic field, you will find that the velocity and the magnetic field are in the same direction. So the cross product VB sine zero will basically give you a value of zero. That means the magnetic field in this particular case is going to be zero. Whenever the particle is moving in the direction of the magnetic field, then the magnetic field will not create any change in the velocity of the particle or the direction of the particle because the particle experiences zero magnetic force. So in our case number one, the Lorentz force law will basically reduce to only the force expression because of the electric field. So the total amount of force that the particle experiences is only going to be a contribution due to the electric field here, which is nothing but QE. All right. And now we are going to invoke the Newton's second law. So the Newton's second law basically tells us that whatever force is being applied to a particle will lead to some sort of an acceleration which is given by F is equal to ma. So we basically get these, this expression. I can write it in terms of vector form and all its components. So if the acceleration along x-axis is ax plus ay and z uh, along y-axis and az along z-axis and this can be written as Q since electric field is only existing along the x-axis so E i cap plus 0 j cap plus 0 z cap because the electric field is not there in the y and the z-axis respectively. So therefore as you can see if I compare individual components that you will then you'll find that a y is equal to 0 and a z is also equal to 0 there is not going to be any kind of an acceleration along the y and the z-axis however AX is basically going to be equal to QE upon M. All right. So there is going to be an acceleration only along the x-axis. The particle is going to start experiencing acceleration only along the x-axis. Let's suppose this is point number one. Let's suppose this is point number two and point number three. 
If the particle has no velocity along the y and the z axis respectively, then it is not going to move along the y and the z axis respectively. So the particle's motion is therefore uh, now only going to be along the x axis. The particle is going to accelerate along the x axis. So the particle is going to move along the x axis. And let's suppose if the particle's displacement is given by x, then I can simply use the kinematics equation, which is basically says that x is equal to some kind of initial velocity v0 t plus half acceleration in the x direction times t square, where let's suppose that the particle is moving with some initial velocity v0. In that case, the displacement of the particle along the x-axis is basically given by x is equal to v0 t plus half where the acceleration is given by q e upon m t square. All right. So this is the equation of motion for the particle which is moving in a direction parallel to that of an external electric field and parallel to an external magnetic field. Only the external electric field will contribute towards the acceleration. The magnetic field will not contribute towards the acceleration at all because V and B here are par parallel to each other and the magnetic force is equal to zero. So the particle is going to move in a straight line and it is going to accelerate. And its displacement is given by this particular equation. In case number two, the charged particle is moving in the presence of only a magnetic field such that the particle's velocity is perpendicular to some kind of a external magnetic field. Again, we are going to apply the Lorentz force law. Since the electric field here is absent, so the Lorentz force law, the first term will come out to be zero and only the second term, the magnetic field will contribute towards the force. So the force is basically equal to Q V cross B. All right. So if a charged particle is moving at a direction perpendicular to a magnetic field, then the force is basically given by uh, this expression and its direction is given by the right hand thumb rule. So you can orient your right hand and uh, pull out the index finger and the middle finger and the thumb in such a manner that they are all perpendicular in three dimensional space. Now, if you look at this motion of the charged particle in such a manner that the index finger is pointing in a direction towards the velocity and the middle finger is pointing in a direction towards the magnetic field then your thumb finger will basically point towards the direction of the force so the force is in a direction of the z-axis all right so if you have the velocity which is going uh, towards the uh, x-axis and if you have the uh, uh, magnetic field which is going towards the y-axis in that case the force is going to happen along the z-axis all right so the force basically will be in a direction in the z axis where the magnitude is given by v b sine 90 degrees which is equal to 1 or force is equal to q v b all right so this is the force experienced by the particle and its direction is in the z axis however every time the particle experiences this force the particle's velocity changes so if the particle is experiencing a force in this direction but the particle is initially moving in this direction its velocity is going to change a little bit the moment its velocity changes the direction of the force itself also changes then the velocity will also change its direction then the force will also change its direction and will keep on happening in such a manner that you will end up getting a trajectory which looks like that of a circle. Let's see how that happens. So if you imagine this to be the plane of motion of the particle so that these red dots basically represent the magnetic field which is coming outwards all right so the magnetic field is coming out of this plane of paper so the magnetic field basically represents the y-axis so this pen represents the y-axis and this plane of paper represents the x and the z axis. So if the velocity of the particle is in this particular direction, then the magnetic field is going to be in the z axis. So this is going to be the direction of the magnetic field. However, the moment this kind of a force uh, of magnetic field applies on the velocity, the velocity direction changes and it traverses, starts traversing in this particular direction. And at every point, as you can see, if the velocity when it reaches here, the magnetic field is in this particular direction. Velocity when it reaches here, the magnetic field is in this particular direction. Uh, the velocity is in this particular direction a magnetic field in this particular direction. So the magnetic field applies at every point in the trajectory of the particle so as to create a circular trajectory. The particle will start moving in a circle. 
So this is the nature of a magnetic field. When a particle is moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, what the magnetic field does is that it changes the trajectory of the particle so that the particle starts moving in a circle in a plane perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. So here if I apply the Newton's second law, which basically means that F is equal to MA, I can apply it here in this particular equation. So MA is basically equal to QVB or A is equal to QV b upon m so this is the let, let's suppose the acceleration experienced by the particle let's suppose this is point number four so if the particle is moving in some kind of a circle like this then we can say that whatever magnetic force is creating the circular motion is providing the centripetal force for this kind of a circular trajectory so the centripetal force is basically equal to the magnetic force so we can say that the centripetal force mv square upon r, so if this kind of a trajectory basically ends up having some kind of a let's suppose radius r, all right? if the radius of the circle is r, in that case mv square by r is equal to qvb upon m or the radius of this kind of a circle is equal to m. So there is no m here, it is the magnetic forces qvb, all right, so m is not present here. So r is just equal to, so v and this v gets cancelled, you end up getting mv by qv. So as you can see here, the radius is uh, of course directly proportional to the velocity and it is inversely proportional to the magnetic field and the charge of the charge particle. We can also calculate the other physical quantities associated with this kind of a circular motion. So for example, we can also calculate the time period required to complete one given revolution. So the time period of revolution is going to be the circumference 2 pi r divided by the velocity. So which is nothing but 2 pi upon v and the radius is nothing but mv upon qb. So v v gets cancelled, you end up getting 2 pi m upon qb. So this is the time period for revolution. Similarly, we can also obtain the other physical quantities, for example, the frequency of revolution. So the frequency of revolution is nothing but 1 upon capital T, which is qb upon 2 pi m. And we can also obtain the angular frequency. So the angular frequency omega is nothing but 2 pi nu which is basically equal to 2 pi multiplied by qb upon 2 pi m or the angular frequency is equal to qb upon m. So as you can see here this angular frequency is no, known as gyro frequency. So as you can see here this angular frequency is independent of the velocity of the particle but it is only dependent on the strength of the magnetic field as well as the mass and the charge. Now that we know that the particle is moving in a circular line, we can come up with the trajectory of motion or equation representing the trajectory of motion. So as you can see here, the particle's motion is restricted to the x and the z axis. So the particle is basically moving in a circle in the x, z plane. There is no velocity component in the y axis. So if we look at the trajectory of the particle, uh, in the x z plane then the particle is moving in a circle so whatever the velocity of the particle it is the velocity can simply be written in terms of the velocity component along the x axis and the velocity component in the z axis because the velocity component in the y axis is going to be zero because the particle is not moving along the y axis all right so now we can try to obtain an equation of motion but since the particle is moving in a circle it's better to obtain an equation of motion in terms of the polar coordinates. So when the particle is moving in some kind of a circle, then its instantaneous velocity, let's suppose that it subtends some kind of an angle with the x-axis, let's suppose that angle is phi, alright. So as the particle is initially in this particular direction and it is moving a circle, that this angle phi basically subtends an angle from 0 to 2 pi with respect to the x-axis. So if the particle is here, then the angle it subtends with the x-axis is phi. If the particle is, let's suppose here, then the angle it subtends with the x-axis is this phi here. If the particle reaches here, the angle it subtends basically is this phi here. So basically what happens is that we can represent the uh, uh, component of velocity with respect to an angular displacement with respect to the x-axis, all right? So if we do that, 
in that case what basically we can do is we can write the uh, velocity term uh, basically as equal to let's suppose v naught being the initial velocity so if the particle was initially moving in this particular direction with a velocity given by v naught then v naught we can write v naught cos phi i cap plus v naught sine phi k cap so here we have basically taken the uh, uh, component along the x axis and the component along the z axis right so cos phi here can be written in terms of omega t where omega is the angular velocity or the angular frequency that we just now obtained so then the velocity can be written as v naught cos omega t i cap plus v naught sin omega t k cap okay so this is the equation for the velocity of the particle where the first uh, term represents the velocity vx along the x-axis and the second term represents the velocity vz along the z-axis. Similarly, we can also obtain an equation for the trajectory or the displacement. So if I want to obtain the displacement along the y-axis and the z-axis, then I can do so by integrating the velocity components. So if I want to obtain the displacement, then along the x-axis, the displacement is simply given by vx dt. Yes, so vx is this. The displacement along the x-axis is given by vx dt. So this is nothing but integration of v naught cos omega t dt. Now, what is omega? We just now obtained that omega is nothing but q b upon m. This is what we obtained as omega, right? So basically, the velocity expression can also be written in terms of this. So this is the omega, the angular frequency that we just now obtained. So this can be written as v naught cos q b upon m t dt, which is nothing but v naught into m by q b sine q b upon m t plus some kind of a constant all right now if you want to find the value of the constant all you need to do is uh, apply initial condition so at uh, let's suppose time t is equal to zero the particle is at the origin let's suppose that time t is equal to zero the particle is the origin so if you have time t is equal to zero the particle is at the origin then x is zero where t is equal to zero so if t is equal to zero sine of some t is zero x is zero then this also comes out to be zero basically if you look at that so basically we can say that x is equal to m v naught upon q b sine q b upon m t all right so this is the equation of motion for the particle in the x direction all right similarly we can also obtain the displacement along the y uh, or along the z axis on the y axis of course the displacement is zero so in the z axis we can do the same thing so this is integration of vz dt so vz is nothing but v naught sine omega t so omega is q b upon m t dt all right so this can be written as v naught multiplied by m by q b minus sign here cos q b upon m t plus some kind of a constant z naught however if you see here we have a cosine expression here so if i apply initial conditions this z naught will not turn out to be zero so if i apply initial conditions so what do you mean by initial conditions that at t is equal to zero z is equal to zero right so if z is equal to zero so this is equal to zero and this is equal to minus m v naught q b cos zero right plus z naught then this basically turns out to be z naught is equal to cos 0 is equal to 1 so z naught turns out to be m v naught upon q b see here so z naught does not turn out to be 1 z naught is basically this expression so this finally therefore becomes z is equal to m v naught by q b comes out to be common so m v naught upon q b 1 minus cos q b upon m t all right so this is the displacement along the z-axis. So for any kind of a particle which is moving uh, in the presence of an external magnetic field such that the velocity is in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field, then the magnetic field will basically lead to the particle moving in a circular trajectory. All right, And the circular trajectory will have a radius which is dependent upon the velocity, but other uh, uh, physical quantities like time period, um, uh, the angular frequency, these are only dependent upon the strength of the magnetic field, the charge and the mass. All right. It is 
is not dependent upon the velocity and its displacement is basically given by these two equations. So in the next case, we basically have a situation in which the particle is moving in a direction which is the x-axis uh, and it is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. The same situation as before except in this case we have an additional electric field also which is going in the y-axis. So the electric field and the magnetic field are parallel and they are directed in the same direction and the particle is moving in a direction perpendicular to both these two fields. Now uh, whatever force this kind of a particle is going to experience now is going to be a result of both the uh, force due to the electric field as well as the force due to the magnetic field. However, just to uh, uh, recall what we did in the previous example, when there was no electric field, when there was no electric field, what the kind of trajectory that we basically saw was that the particle started moving in the yz plane in a circular motion. There is no force due to magnetic field in the y axis. However, if you look at only the electric field, the electric field will lead to a force which will only exist along the y axis. So as you can see that the force components, if you think about the force components, the force component due to the magnetic field will be along the x and the z axis while the force component due to the electric field will be along the y axis. So you will get some kind of a circular motion which is accelerating along the y axis. So let's go back to the velocity expression that we obtained in our previous uh, case. So in our previous case we wrote that the instantaneous velocity for the particle was nothing but uh, so here we can write the vx component along the x-axis plus the vy component along the y-axis and the vz component along the z-axis. So in our previous example the vy component was zero and only the vx and vz component were determined by the magnetic field. So here since the electric field is not contributing towards uh, the uh, any kind of a force in the x or the z-axis we can write our previous expression here. So vx is nothing but v0 cos qb upon mt i cap plus vy j cap plus v0 sin qb upon m t k cap. So the vx and vz we obtained from our previous case scenario. vy is something which is a result because a result of the electric field itself. So let's look at what is going to be the nature of motion because of the electric field. So electric field is going to directly create an acceleration along the y axis. So if you look at the force due to electric field then in that case the electric field will exert a force which is equal to QE and if I apply Newton's second law then M of A now A will be basically along the same direction as the E so E is along the Y axis so A will be basically acceleration along the Y axis this is equal to QE or the acceleration along Y axis is equal to QE upon M. So the particle will experience acceleration along the Y axis which is equal to this right. So let's suppose the particle had no initial velocity along the y-axis. All its initial velocity was along the x-axis. In that case the velocity of the particle along the y-axis is simply given by vy is equal to vy0 which is the initial velocity plus a y t but vy0 let's suppose for our case is equal to zero so this comes out to be qe upon m by t. So now I can write this velocity expression quite simply as v is equal to v0 cos qb upon m t i cap plus vy is qe upon m j cap plus v0 sine of qb upon m t k cap. So this is going to be the uh, velocity expression for this kind of a particle where the velocity component along y and the z axis will be the same as the earlier case where the particle was experiencing only a magnetic field in a perpendicular direction and now the only difference is that the vy component will be uh, non-zero it will basically uh, be the result of an acceleration experienced because of the electric field. We can also obtain the nature of the trajectory so nature of the trajectory can be simply obtained by integrating the vx component and the vy component and the vz component separately. Now in the previous example I already integrated the vx as well as the vz component separately. Now you can simply do an integration of the ui component also. So if I do an integration on the individual terms by integrating with respect to time in that case I will obtain the position vector alright. So if I integrate with respect to time I am going to use the expressions I obtained in the previous example. Okay there is a time uh, sort of a 
term here which I forgot to wrote. So now if I uh, do in the integration then the integration simply gives me a constant term m v0 upon q b sin q b upon m t i cap. So this is the because of the result of the x-axis motion plus 1 minus cos of q b upon m t k cap right so this is the result of the magnetic field plus the integration of this with respect to t will give you half of q e upon m t square in the y axis so this is the uh, nature uh, equation for the trajectory of the particle as you can see here the x axis motion and the uh, z axis motion will create circular motion in the xz plane but there is going to be an acceleration along the uh, uh, y axis. So what is going to be the resultant motion or the resultant trajectory of this kind of a particle. So the resultant motion will look, some, look something like this. So the resultant motion will some look something like a helical structure but not exactly a helix because uh, uh, so for every sort of a, a, a completion of a term a turn the horizon this kind of a distance will keep on increasing. So in this case let's suppose this is P2 and this is P1 so P2 would be greater than P1. So usually in a helix what happens is that P2 and P1 will be equal but in this case P2 will be greater than P1 so this is the distance between every Every single rotation that is taking place. So what is happening is that the particle is trying to rotate in a circle in the xz plane. However, because of the electric field, it is also accelerating in the y axis. So this will lead to this kind of a motion. If you look at the projection onto the xz plane, you will see a kind of a circular trajectory. However, if you look at it normally, you will see a kind of an acceleration of the particle which is also happening in the y axis. And because of this acceleration, the distance between two rotations keeps on increasing over time. So for a charged particle which is moving in a direction perpendicular to both an electric and magnetic field, you will end up getting this kind of a trajectory. So now in our last case we basically have a situation where we have a crossed electric and magnetic field. So the magnetic field and the electric field are perpendicular to each other and let's suppose there is a charged particle at the origin which is at rest. We are assuming rest because uh, if they, it has some kind of a velocity then that velocity will only get added later on to whatever solution that we obtain. So if the charge particle is at rest and let's suppose the electric field is in the uh, let's suppose the z axis. So the electric field basically is along the z axis. So E k and the magnetic field is let's suppose along the x axis. The magnetic field is along the x axis alright. So first you can try to think of what kind of a force and what kind of a trajectory this kind of a situation will lead to but uh, uh, it might get a little bit confusing because initially the charged particle is not going to experience any magnetic force because the charged particle is at rest. However, it is going to experience an electric force and it's going to start accelerating along the z-axis. But the moment it starts accelerating along the z-axis, it's going to start experiencing magnetic force. And when it starts experiencing magnetic force, its trajectory is going to change. How is it going to change? What is going to be the final uh, nature of the trajectory? So to do that, let's first start with the Lorentz force law. So Lorentz force law basically gives us the amount of force because of the electric as well as the magnetic field. So this is the Lorentz force law where E as I just now told you is basically only existing along the z axis. So 0 i cap plus 0 j cap plus E k cap alright and the magnetic field is only existing along the x axis. So B i cap plus 0 j cap plus z k cap. Now whatever the trajectory of this kind of a particle is going to be then that trajectory uh, will have some kind of a solution of R which is going to consist of uh, a, let's suppose uh, displacements along the uh, x axis uh, as well as the y axis and as well as the z axis. However, before I uh, uh, start solving this problem, first I want to make it clear from this diagram itself that because the electric field is in the z-axis, the electric field force will be along the z-axis, alright? The force due to electric field will be along this direction. And once the particle starts accelerating along this direction, uh, the particle's velocity is in this direction, the magnetic force is going to be given by the right hand thumb rule. So the magnetic force initially is going to be along the y-axis, while uh, 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 the electric force is initially going to be along the uh, z-axis, right? Now the moment 
moment the particle experiences both a magnetic as well as electric uh, force the uh, vector sum of these two forces will be somewhere in the yz plane itself so the velocity will start turning towards the yz plane however at no point in time will the particle experience a force along the x axis so please uh, just try to uh, uh, concentrate on this particular point. The electric field force will always be directed along the z-axis and the magnetic uh, force initially will be directed along the y-axis and later on when the velocity trajectory changes will be directed along the y-z plane because the magnetic force is always in a plane which is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field itself. So the resultant of the electric as well as the magnetic field will be concentrated or constrained in the y-z plane. There is going to be no force force component along the x-axis. The electric field will no ha not have any force component along the x-axis and neither will the magnetic field have a force component along the x-axis because magnetic fields do not have uh, forces in the same direction as the magnetic field. It only has a force component in a direction perpendicular to, it, uh, to itself. Or, or in a plane perpendicular to itself. So what I want to uh, take as granted from the beginning is that the displacement along the x-axis itself is going to be zero because there is going to be no force along the x-axis either due to the electric or the magnetic field. Whatever the forces are there, they will only lead to displacement along the y as well as the z-axis. So I can write initially from the starting itself is that the displacement, whatever it is, is going to be restricted only along the y as well as the z-axis. All right. So if this is going to be the dis nature of the displacement, then what is going to be the nature of the velocity? The velocity is also going to be uh, restricted to the yz plane only. So you are going to have vy j cap plus vz k cap, which is nothing but the time derivative of y. Uh, let's suppose the time derivative of y I am representing by y dot and the time derivative of z right let's suppose this is the velocity vector now let's come back let's go, come back to the force law that the uh, lorentz force law that we used the lorentz force law contains two terms the qe term and the qv cross b term right so now let's look at the term v cross b because this is a cross product all right so this is a cross product along the i j and k axis so the v as we just now explained to you the, there's not going to be any kind of a force in the x-axis so there is not going to be any kind of an acceleration in the x-axis and if the initial velocity of the particle is zero the velocity along the x-axis is also equal to zero however along the y and the z-axis you have y dot and z dot and the magnetic field as defined is only along the x-axis that along y and z-axis at zero okay so this cross product will simply give me so the cross product of v cross b is going to yield to me this expression b z dot j cap minus b y dot k cap all right so basically what we get is v cross b is going to give me b z dot j cap minus b y dot k cap now what is uh, uh, z dot and this thing this is nothing but uh, the velocity along the z axis and the velocity along the y axis that's it so now let's use the lorentz force law with the, on the entire expression so f is nothing but equal to q e plus v cross b here f basically is uh, the uh, force experienced by the particle where we can introduce the newton second law and say that this is going to result in some kind of an acceleration a let's suppose so this is equal to q e plus q v cross b all right so this is nothing but if i write this entire term in terms of the acceleration experience along the x-axis plus the acceleration experience along the y-axis plus the acceleration experience along the z-axis then this is going to be equal to since electric field is only along the z-axis so the component of the electric field along the x and the y-axis is going to be zero the component of the electric field is only along the z-axis okay zero i cap plus zero j cap plus e k cap and this is q b z dot j cap minus b y dot k cap so this becomes zero i cap plus q b z dot j cap plus q e minus e minus b y dot k cap so we can look at the individual components here so the individual components uh, basically give us 
that the acceleration along the x-axis is basically going to be zero which is obvious because there is no force component along that particular direction the acceleration along the y-axis is basically given by q b z dot upon m and the acceleration along the z-axis is basically given by q e minus b y dot upon m so the acceleration along the x-axis is zero so there is going to be no motion along the x-axis so now if we want to study the motion we'll have to look at these two individual equations all right so let's look at these equations so the acceleration along the y-axis which can only be also be written as d v y upon d t all right this is the acceleration along the y axis is basically equal to q b upon m z dot so z dot is nothing but d z upon d t all right so this is the this is the second equation that we just now obtained so its second equation can be written as d v y by d t is equal to q b by m d z upon d t so this is nothing but d v y upon d t is basically equal to q b by m dz upon dt is what this is vz all right this is the velocity component along the z axis or we can write that vz is equal to m upon q by b d v y upon dt all right let's remember this expression as let's suppose equation number uh, uh, a all right now the next equation is the equation this one so acceleration along the z axis so let's suppose the acceleration along the z axis can be uh, uh, written as d v z upon d t is nothing but q by m e minus b d y upon d t right there is no m here so this is the acceleration along the z axis d v z upon d t is equal to q e by m minus q b upon m d y by d t which is nothing but v y so let's say this is equation number b all right so now vz is uh, so there is a vz d vz upon dt term here so let's differentiate equation number a so if i uh, uh, differentiate equation a with respect to time then we get d vz upon dt is nothing but m upon qb d2 vy upon dt2 all right so if i use this in equation b in that case if i use this term here in equation number b here then i can write m upon qb is equal to or m upon qb d2 vy by d t2 is equal to qe by m minus qb by m vy now this is an entire equation in terms of the uh, variable vy itself all right so i can simplify i rearrange the terms and write that d2 vy upon dt2 plus so qb goes this side m goes this here qb upon m whole square vy is equal to q upon m whole square e and b this thing all right so this is nothing but a second order differential equation with constant coefficients in fact this is a non homogeneous second order differential equation with constant coefficients all right so q b m these are all constants in this case and the variable is v y so uh, a solution of this kind of a differential equation will basically give us v y and how it varies with respect to uh, uh, time all right now if you're familiar with how to find the solutions of different these kind of differential equations then you'd probably know that equations of this form can be solved by uh, writing down what is known as the auxiliary equation so let's try to find out the solution of this kind of equation all right so the auxiliary equation basically can be written in terms differential operator so this can be basically written as d square so the second order derivative is d square plus q b upon m whole square and we equate it to basically equal to zero all right to find the solution of the auxiliary equation and here this is nothing but d square is equal to minus q b upon m whole square or this can be written as d is equal to plus minus i q b upon m all right so the solution of the this kind of an auxiliary equation is known as complementary function all right so basically the roots are basically there are two roots uh, the roots are of the form let's suppose alpha plus minus i beta all right so there alpha here is zero and beta here is this 
imaginary term so whenever the roots of the auxiliary equation are imaginary and it can be written as alpha plus minus i beta where alpha is the is let's suppose the real number and beta is let's suppose the imaginary number then the complementary function uh, uh, which can be uh, used to find the final general solution is basically nothing but e to the power alpha t a cos beta t plus b sin beta t all right so this is the nature of the solution if you have a imaginary or a complex uh, uh, solution to the auxiliary equation here alpha is of course equal to zero all right and beta is uh, nothing but q b upon m so finally we can write down the solution of the auxiliary equation as uh, the complementary function is nothing but equal to a cos beta is nothing but q b upon m t plus b sin q b upon m t all right so here in this case a and b are some kind of a constants whose values we are going to find later on to find the complete solution we also need to find out the particular integral the particular integral can be uh, found in this particular manner where we use the function of the differential operator q and multiply it with the constant on the right hand side which is basically this constant so q by m whole square e b and then e to the power 0 t all right so this is nothing but 1 by f 0 q by m whole square e b e to the power 0 t which is nothing but 1 so this is nothing but 1 by the differential equation for the differential operator so this is the differential operator this is the auxiliary equation so this equation basically we have to write here so d square plus q b upon m whole square q upon m whole square e b this is nothing but equal to 1 so here we put the value of d is as 0 so if this is 0 square plus q b upon m whole square q upon m whole square e b all right so this comes out to be basically q b by m whole square multiplied by q by m whole square e b so q gets cancelled m gets cancelled b gets cancelled with b square here uh, so you are left with e by b all right so this is the particular integral so the general solution basically is uh, the sum of the complementary function plus the particular integral so we can say that vy vy here is basically equal to the complementary function here which we just now uh, 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 obtained which is equal to a cos q b upon m t plus b sin q b upon m t plus e by b all right so this is the solution for the velocity along the y-axis or the velocity component along the y-axis however we need to also determine the constants a and b so to determine those let's apply the initial values so the solution that we got for vy was basically e by b all right so for uh, initial values as i said the particle was at rest initially so at time t is equal to zero the velocity vy component was also equal to zero let's suppose all right so if at time t is equal to zero this vy is zero and you have a cos uh, zero plus b sine zero plus e by b all right so this basically gives us this comes out to be zero and you are left with uh, the cos 0 is nothing but 1 so you are left with a is basically minus e by b all right so here please don't get confused i have used the terms a and b here but these two terms basically represent the constants it does not represent the magnetic field so this is the magnetic field b here this is just a constant let's suppose so uh, we can distinguish this constant but let's suppose taking a dash okay let's suppose this is a dash and b dash all right so just to distinguish them from the uh, magnetic field so a dash is basically equal to minus e by b so let's suppose this is the first constant let's suppose this is c what how what how do we obtain the uh, second constant so to do that we are going to go back to our original uh, equation for vz so when we were deriving this expression we obtain equation number a where vz is the equal to m q by b dy by dt right so since we have obtained uh, as an expression for vy now we can also obtain expression of vz by just doing a time derivative of vy right right so vz um, is simply equal to m upon q b d v y upon d t right so let's do a derivative of v y if i do a derivative of v y then v z simply comes out to be m upon q b multiplied by q b upon m uh, minus a dash sine q 
QB upon MT plus B dash cos QB upon MT all right the last term E by B will uh, as derivative will come out to be zero right so this is the expression for let's suppose the um, uh, component along the uh, velocity component along the Z axis so VZ is equal to minus A dash sine Q by B M T plus B dash cos Q by B M T all right so this is the velocity along the z axis all right now i can also apply initial conditions on the velocity uh, and the z axis so at time t is equal to 0 vz is also equal to 0 right so this can be is equal to minus az sin 0 plus bz cos 0 so this is equal to 1 cos 0 is 1 sin 0 is 0 so you end up getting b dash is basically equal to zero all right so you have the first constant and you have the second constant here so the first constant a dash is equal to minus e by b and the second constant b dash is equal to zero now i can write both these two equations using the constants as being equal to minus e by b cos q b upon mt plus b dash is of course zero plus e by b all right or vy is equal to e by b i can take outside 1 minus cos qb upon m t all right so this is the velocity component along the y axis and the velocity component along the z axis is nothing but e by b and you get sine qb upon m t b dash is of course zero so this is the velocity component along the z axis so and we of course know the velocity component along the x axis is of course zero as i initially discussed all right so these are the velocity components along the x y and z axis so finally whatever velocity uh, a vector exists the velocity vector can simply be written as a uh, uh, vx i cap plus vy uh, j cap plus vz k cap all right and we can also obtain the trajectories uh, corresponding to x y and z uh, by doing uh, 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 an integration of vx vy and vz all right so now to obtain the final trajectory we obtain the displacement so vx is zero so if i integrate with respect to x x will also come out to be zero given that initially the particle was at the origin all right now vy is this expression so um, for, for along the y axis the y displacement is going to be vy dt all right so y is basically equal to vy which is e by b let's suppose one minus cos so this constant we can denote as something else let's suppose uh, omega t all right uh, so omega is basically equal to q b upon m all right let's suppose this is a constant because these are all constant mass uh, charge and the magnetic field so this expression can be written as e by b uh, 1 minus cos omega t dt all right so this expression can be finally be written as e by b so integration this will become t minus integration of cosine function will become minus 1 by omega sine omega t plus some kind of a constant let's suppose y naught all right now if you apply initial values in the case of y naught so if at time t is equal to 0 the particle was at the origin then this will also come out to be 0 which is which is obvious kind of so finally the displacement along the y axis can be written as e upon let's suppose b omega omega t minus sine omega t all right so this is the uh, expression for the displacement along the y-axis here again let me assume a constant let's suppose e upon b omega is equal to some constant a okay in that case this can be written as uh, y is equal to a and let's suppose omega small t is equal to capital T because uh, this is just a constant multiplied by the time so this is let's suppose some capital T which is equal to omega multiplied by small t which is the original time uh, uh, variable that we took so this can be just written as a capital T minus sine capital T all right so this let's keep a, a note of what these expression t basically is this a is basically this where omega is basically equal to this all right now lastly we can obtain the sort of z displacement in the z axis so the displacement in the z axis is simply integration of vz in dt which is nothing but vz is e by b d uh, uh, sine 
Q B upon M T D T. All right. So this simply basically gives me minus E by B cos. So this is the constant omega that we have used here. Let's again use omega t plus some kind of a constant z0. But z0 here is not going to come out to be 0 if I use the initial values that at time t is equal to 0, z is equal to 0. If I use this, then this comes out to be 0 is equal to minus e by b cos 0 plus z0. All right. So since cos 0 is not equal to uh, 0, cos 0 is equal to 1. So z0 basically comes out to be e by b. All right. So if I use this here, uh, then basically this whole thing becomes z is equal to uh, minus e by b cos omega t plus e by b or z is equal to e by b 1 minus cos omega t. Sorry, I forgot to write down this uh, integration while integrating. We have to divide by the constant omega. I forgot to write this down. All right. So omega will come out here and omega will come out here and omega will come out here. And there is going to be omega term here and here. And there is going to be an omega term here. All right. So E B omega is nothing but A as we have uh, assumed. All right. And uh, omega T is nothing but T. In that case, we can write this whole equation as Z is equal to A. 1 minus cos t. All right. So finally, let me write down the final equation of motion for the entire trajectory. X came out to be 0 and Y came out to be uh, 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 this expression. So Y is equal to A t minus sin t and Z came out to be Z is equal to A 1 minus cos t. So these are going to be the equations that define the trajectory of the particle. Now, if you have seen these equations before, you probably know that these equations basically uh, represent the equations of a cycloid. Okay, so what is what is a cycloid? To understand a cycloid, so as again, the, uh, if I if I represent it in the x, y, and z axis, so let's suppose this is the uh, this is the y axis and this is the z axis and this is the x axis. All right. So there is no motion along the x axis. However, there is motion along the y and the z axis, which is given by the equations of the cycloid. So to explain the motion of a cycloid, a cycloid simply uh, it basically looks like a curve like this. All right. It basically looks like a curve like this. What happened is that how can you explain it? Imagine that there is some kind of a wheel. All right. Imagine that there is some kind of a wheel. All right. And you mark the wheel uh, uh, along the circumference of the wheel. You mark some kind of a point. If the wheel starts rotating in a given direction, then after some time, the wheel will reach a certain position. Then what is going to be the point? The point is going to reach here. And after some time, the wheel is going to reach a particular position. The point is going to be here. After some time, the wheel is going to reach a particular point. The point is going to be here. So if a wheel is rotating on a plane surface and I mark a point on the surface of the wheel, then as the wheel is rotating, then the trajectory that is traced by this particular point which I marked on the wheel is going to represent what is known as a cycloid. So what is going to happen to the point mass particle? So this is the charge particle initially. Yes. So the electric field was initially along the z-axis, right? So the electric field was initially along the z-axis and the magnetic field was initially along the x-axis, right? So what is going to happen is that the particle is going to be restricted to a motion along the y-z plane along a trajectory of a cycloid because these equations represent the equations of motion for a cycloid. So this is kind of summarizing the entire video. We discuss all these four different cases. So in the first case, the particle was moving parallel to the direction of electric and magnetic field both. And electric field and magnetic field are both directed in the x-axis and the particle velocity vector is also in the x-axis. In this case, the particle was moving in a straight line and it was accelerating along the straight line along the x-axis. In case number two, there was no electric field, but there was the velocity vector of the particle which was perpendicular to the magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field made the particle move in a circular motion and the circular motion took place in the y z plane only in the case number three you had the magnetic field and the velocity vector which are perpendicular to each other but there was an additional electric field along the y axis so what we got is the particles start moving in some kind of a spiral motion or a kind of a helical motion in which the period between these two rotations kept on increasing because a particle is accelerating along the y axis 
And lastly, because the particle was present in the crossed electric and magnetic field, the particle was restricted to the yz plane in which it is moving along some kind of a trajectory which is known as a, which is given by the equations of a cycloid. So as you saw, we discussed different kinds of scenarios in which uh, uh, the charged particle is present in different kinds of electric and magnetic field. So depending upon what is the direction of the electric and a magnetic field and what is the orientation of the velocity of the particle with respect to the electric and magnetic field, we see different kinds of trajectory. The particle might move in a straight line, it might move in a circle, it might move in a cycloid, it might move in some kind of a helical pattern. So depending upon what is the direction of the electric field, magnetic field and the velocity vector, we can get different kinds of scenarios. So these are the four different cases that I've discussed in today's video. I hope you have learned something from today's video. That is it for today. Thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you in the next video.